everyone and welcome. My name is Jody Williams and I am a co-chair for the First Nations Métis Inuit Education Association of Ontario. Um, and we're really excited to host uh, the part three of our webinar series, We Come From the Stars. Uh, tonight we have with us uh, Dana Nez. Unfortunately, Hohepa could not join in tonight, but we will um, look at uh, extending our series so that we will get to hear from him. But we have a great talk planned for tonight. Um, so our association is an educator association and our main priorities are in advocating for Indigenous education across Ontario. Um, this series is in partnership with the Math Knowledge Network as part of our community of practice looking at Indigenous knowledge and mathematics, um, which led to this wonderful series that we are now offering. And the work that we do, um, we primarily make uh, resources uh, available, uh, provide uh, workshops and other forms of professional development to support uh, the teaching and learning of Indigenous education across the province. And this work is really guided by um, our Provincial Elders Advisory Council. And these, um, our council members uh, really are the ones who help set the goals and direction um, and vet the resources that we put together and provide. Um, many of them are fluent language speakers uh, and former residential school survivors. So at this time, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our host uh, for this evening. Thank you, Jody. Hi, everybody. Um, we're excited uh, that you've come to join us tonight. Um, as Jody mentioned, this is the third uh, webinar, um, the third sort of knowledge hub that um, Jody and others have designed for us tonight. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's been one that I've been looking forward to for a while now. Um, and I just wanted to just introduce a couple of thoughts uh, as we move into this conversation. Um, basically just thinking about, uh, you know, ethical citational practices, um, remembering that these folks and many of the witnesses to these conversations have made offerings of these knowledges and that they've created and extended kinships to receive these knowledges from the stars and of the stars in relationality. And we want to practice a radical relational ethical citational practice to extend care and to reciprocate some of the knowledges that folks are sharing with us. We extend care through being thoughtful, through ethical witnessing practices, through non-extractive practices towards knowledges. And these are some of the ways that we can share care towards each other in this moment of deep listening um, and of extending care to others, including knowledge holders. Many conversations have been part of these series, um, skill sharing, knowledge sharing, care and support for these conversations by Priya, Corinne and Jody. I see this work as being practicing a rematriative ethic of knowledge sharing within this group of fantastic humans. And I just wanted to acknowledge these humans for their passion, their dedication, their time and spatial gifting in making all of this happen. So thank you. Um, last week, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what, ha what happened last week. We had Carlos and Isaac extend and offer a conversation. And what it's gotten me to think about is what does this series make possible? What kinds of futures are we co-creating together, um, co-curating, creating as we explore in these ways in this moment? Last week, Carlos explored ways in which stars are protective devices. I wanted to spend some time to just hold space for that thought. What is this work doing in the world? And I feel like it's almost like providing alternative forms of care through experiencing together these, this almost like a synapse of um, electrical fields or fulcrums of relationality. So thank you for all of these gifts that folks are um, offering into these spaces. I'm really excited about this conversation, um, particularly because I feel like Jody and Dana are really important leaders in these knowledge systems and these ways of knowing. And 
I'm excited for this because Jody is going to reflect upon some of the experiences that Jody has had um, weaving knowledge together in conversation with Dana. Um, in thinking about the experience of being together when we could be together and share space, I think are important provocations to, to revisit. Um, and as they share sort of celestial and terrestrial knowledges. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for this conversation. I just wanted to introduce Dana. I know that Dana, um, you'll probably be introducing yourself as well. Um, but Dana is a Navajo uh, woman um, her, actually, she was raised on the Navajo Nation at the foot of the sacred Cheska Mountain. I want to hear more about this mountain because it sounds absolutely important. Um, and uh, beside from tr traditional teachings, um, Dana has learned from her grandmother, so a, a genealogy of care and knowledge sharing within their family. Um, Dana has earned a master's degree in Diné culture, language, and leadership at the Navajo, Navajo Technical University, where Dana is currently an assistant professor in the same program. And this program focuses on Navajo linguistics and traditional Navajo ceremonial knowledge. She also serves on the board of directors for the Navajo Language Academy and hopes that their work with NASA, with NASA, 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 sorry, I was just planning the NASA conference that had to get canceled, um, with NASA and their native communities um, and inspires others through recognizing their and indigenous and native paradigms as valid and important knowledges. So welcome Dana, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, hi, Karen, thank you. Um, Jehe, Dana, this is uh <laughs> I'm a Navajo person. I have four clans, and from these clans, I I be a, a Navajo woman, and I'm from here. Where I'm coming to you from, um, um that means spotted oak. Um, more generically, it's called Tuhachi. But yeah, I'm from here. I'm raised here. I was born here. Like, this is my home, and everything about my home from the dirt to the, the, the few trees and lots of bushes and the mountains and the hills that I, I you know, that I'm from, they made me who I am. So it is my pleasure to be here with you all. We are so glad that you're here, thank you. Um, Jody, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So, Ani Bojo, Mianka Jadaka Dishnika, Salamak Dodem, Anishnabe Kwe, Mimwa Arish Kwe, and Dao, Georgia Bay Nakin Gabinjaba. So, hello, my name is Jody, and um, it's a real pleasure to be um, sitting here with my friend Dana and uh, Karen. And I just also want to acknowledge uh, Corinne and Priya, who are uh, behind the scenes helping make all of this happen. So, without them, this would not be possible. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's a little bit. And oh, I should say most importantly, I'm, uh, I'm the mother of five girls and a new grandmother uh, to one beautiful baby girl that we just welcomed into this uh, interesting world we're now living in. Um, and so we're just really grateful to have everyone living with us um, at this time. And we're just taking every little moment we can to enjoy this precious life that we've been blessed with. So. Um, kudos to my husband. Uh, we live in a house with one bathroom. So that's um, seven, five, six, seven girls and, and Kevin. <laughs> um, so, so that's me. <laughs> I also um, think that emergent from these kinds of conversations are uh, thinking about our relationship to children um, through the stars and our our care that we offer our children and um, the, and recognizing the place where they've come from 
um, that this is a moment to really, you know, acknowledge that and to hold space for that. And um, I find that these emergent um, thoughts and emergent um, ideas and ancestral thoughts and ideas are really, I'm learning a lot about my relationship with my child, uh, Gracie, through this process too. So thank you for that. Yes, and actually on that note, um, her uh, name is actually uh, in reference to, it's uh, Gungwa Age, and it's in reference to, she was born during the Lyrid meteor shower. So it's in reference to, uh, describes a shooting star. Um, and jokingly, it also is the name for werewolf and she's quite hairy. So we're like, perfect. You're going to be a ferocious warrior woman when you're older. So, so definitely the stars are very important to us. <laughs> um, Jody, do you want to talk a little bit about um, when you went to uh, visit Dana um, in Dana's traditional territories and that sort of yes. how did that relationship emerge? And we'd love to hear about that. Absolutely. And just before I'll just finish off this slide deck, because I have to open a new slide deck for that. Um, so just a reminder, all of the um, videos are being recorded and are posted at this site here. And we will share out the link um, afterwards as well to all of you. If you registered, um, then we'll just send that out to everyone who's on that list. And uh, not to miss out on our next week, which is going to be with Wilfred and Daniela, who I believe are, are listening in as part of uh, the series as well. Um, so just to acknowledge them. Uh, so, so please register and join us next week at the same time uh, for a really exciting conversation. So I'm just going to change over the slide deck. So what you're seeing here is, um, well, actually, that's Hohepa in the background, ironically. <laughs> he sends his sincere apologies again for not being able to be with us tonight. Um, so we were, we had the great fortune of traveling out to visit Dana and this relationship that we've grown into um, has actually come from a relationship with Daniela, who I just had mentioned there, who's going to be presenting next week who works with NASA and the work that she and NASA were involved with, with the Navajo Nation in that partnership. Um, and so I'm actually going to just ask Dana to just uh, share a little bit about that relationship, because I think it's really important that story um, and how it impacted you, Dana, is important because it, it's directly related to a lot of the work that we're doing when we talk about the importance of holding space and making space in the institution's um, and those educational settings that are so heavily uh, dominated um, through this Western paradigm that we're trying to bust through. So if you want to just share a little bit about that relationship, Dina. Absolutely. I'm delighted and honored to uh, mention my good friend, Daniela Scalise. Um, Daniela always believed in me and she empowered me um, she being a non-Navajo coming from NASA to our country, she, she and my mom and other Navajo like scholars like dealing with directly with Navajo education, they devised um, a partnership to, to bring STEM to Navajo. And what they found was that Navajo, Navajo children, Navajo thought, Navajo life ways is scientific. And once we bring that Navajo knowledge to the STEM, we are one and the same. We are together. Our knowledge backs up theirs just as much as theirs backs up ours. We compare these things, we, we correlate these things. And it's incredible. Like when you show that to kids, um, you take them around to these Navajo sites of significance and you, you have the scientists with you and you also have the medicine people with you. They tell stories and these stories, they, they're, they're naturally the same, like essentially the same. So we ended up, um, you know, do, uh, doing all these summer camps to inspire 
Navajo kids. And at the same time, like, I started with the NASA and Navajo Nation partnership as um, a, a, what do you call it, like a, a guide, like not a guide, but I, I was, I was um, a camp counselor. I had to keep the kids all together, you know, when we we're on these hikes and stuff. I had to make sure that we we're all there and everyone got fed and everyone was good. But yeah, um, I started off as a camp counselor and then I literally got thrown into the role as um, a camp leader, like a, a cultural teacher. Like, there's a, we always do segments, we have programming, you know, and there's, there's supposed to be somebody who's going to be there to talk about, you know, the cultural part. And my mom, you know, like she, she's getting a little older. She couldn't go on that part of the hike with us. And since I was camp counselor, she said, here, go. When you get to this point in the hike, you're going to teach these children what this is. And <clears throat> all I have is like a lifetime of knowledge, you know, like what my aunts and my uncles, my grandma, or my che, my, my grandfather, what they taught me. And so <laughs> when I got to the top of the mountain, it was my turn like to teach the kids something about culture. I surprised myself knowing more than I really thought I did. But um, yeah, so that started me off with the NASA and Navajo Nation Partnership. But Daniela never doubted me. And over time, I, as I grew in, like I eventually went to Navajo Tech. They have an undergraduate program in the NEST studies. I joined a program and yeah, like everything I researched, everything I look for, was evident, like you know, like um, with the, with the 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 NASA science that we do, you know. And so, I grew with it. Um, everything that I know now, I know that we can we can share this. This is knowledge that is Navajo knowledge that also has a uh, NASA scientific comparison that can go with it and when you learn both of them you master both of them you're you're like master of, 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 of learning you know you walk into worlds like you are not only a, a Navajo person but you're also successful in the you know the, the scientific world so yeah um, Daniela really um, she encouraged me, like, I was an undergrad, like, she met me before my, I was even an undergrad. I went into the master's program, and she still, she backed me up then, too, and she never had no doubt about me, and, like, as I was being a student, you know, she was also um, having me help her run these camps. I, my, my greatest, um, my greatest achievement, you know, uh, belongs to my parents, but Daniela, she helped me. She gave me space to learn. She gave me space to grow. She helped me develop myself. Like I was already a scientist, but she backed me up with that, you know, with, with that power of NASA. <laughs> um, yeah, she really stood behind me and she encouraged me. And that's what the partnership does. It's meant to um, inspire Native children to re reclaim their identities as, as um, scientists. And Navajo Lifeways, that's the connection. We are naturally Navajo scientists. And we're trying to help them reclaim their identities as such. And in my work and, and being, like, being part of this whole partnership, that's what it's done for me. So. Uh, I recently, uh, on last Friday, uh, the convocation ceremony was done virtually and I uh, got my Master of Arts degree in the Night Culture Language and Leadership. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have thought about coming this far without the support of people like Daniela. That's so amazing. Uh -huh. And congratulations again on your Master's. 
and pretty soon a PhD. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And then, and then taking over NASA, getting them sorted out. <laughs> so, yeah, so we want it. So this, yeah, as Dana was saying, this, um, you know, it always comes down to relationships um, and taking the time to build those bridges. And so this, going back to this picture here, um, you know, building on those wonderful relationships. So here we are um, out visiting Dana at Chaco Canyon. And, you know, when we were out there, I didn't realize actually, um, I had read about this significant site uh, and I didn't realize that we were actually at this place. Uh, so when we went out to Chaco Canyon and I found out that this pictograph was there, I was like, what? This, this, so this pictograph that you're looking at is, um, is a, a supernova that happened in 1054. And they say um, it was so bright when the star exploded that it would have looked like another moon in the sky. And you would have seen it for uh, several months, even during the day. And it was so, um, and so there's a few sites around the world where this was recorded and this was one of them. And so we had to hike out, it was a full day hike. Um, and we went out there and actually uh, Dea Hande, who's going to be a part of this series as well, was with us. Um, and so we gave offerings and uh, it was just such a really, I don't know, words can't even describe how amazing it was. But what, um, what we wanna talk about and why this is connected into what we're doing is, so here's Dana taking, so this is, if we were to stand behind us is the, where the pictograph was. And this is us looking out and you can see off in the distance, like we hiked, if you can see to the far, far right, we hiked like way from way over there. Um, it was a long hike, but where Dean is looking, she's holding up her phone and you can see it kind of zoomed in um, with the um, app uh, that you can use to look at stars and it'll tell you where things are in the sky, even during the day. And it actually, and it matched up um, because where you're looking out into in the middle kind of of that area is actually what's now known as the Crab Nebula. Um, and that's the star that went supernova that's recorded there. So here's a picture of the uh, Crab Nebula. Um, and interestingly, uh, astronomers, this is the first neutron star that was discovered in the Crab Nebula. Um, and so another really cool place uh, out at Chaco Canyon and you know, thankfully it's, it's closed off because, you know, every time sites are relayed to the public, there's, I mean, there's such a fascination, I suppose, as well, but then they get trampled on and the sites start to get disturbed and ruined and things like that. But, um, but what was really amazing here was, and there's other sites around the world, but these places show the sophistication and the mathematics and the in, in immense knowing of, of cycles, natural um, elements and, you know, solar cycles, lunar cycles, and everything that's so significant to um, being connected to all of those things. And so at this um, place, there's these engravings, um, there's these spirals. And what's really cool is that I thought was outstanding was not only was it a, a solar alignment, um, so when the sun comes through these uh, rocks, they uh, make these little sun daggers, they're called. And there's these, this spiral pictograph here. Um, and then there's a smaller one over here. So you can see in this overlaid picture um, that it precisely bisects this uh, spiral. But what was really cool was that it also shows this 18.6 year lunar cycle. So every 18.6 years, there's a minimum and a maximum rising of the moon. And I think Kahu, um, when he's going to be talking in these series, most likely he will talk about this as well, because he does a lot of research in regards to um, the lunar cycles and the inf impact of, of the moon. Um, but to be this precise in this carving with this spiral, um, so this spiral goes out uh, nine times and a bit. And so it, it precisely matches up that 
uh, 18.6 year procession that the moon goes back and forth. So, you know, just incredible knowledge that is, you know, that resides here um, that shows the sophistication of knowledge systems that Indigenous peoples have had and continue to have today. So this is uh, this other, the place where these buildings are and all of them have these amazing constructions that are all aligned with the rising and setting of the sun and moon at certain times. So I don't know if you want to add to any of that, Dina, before we get into your, your talk. Well, well, yeah, like, okay, so it has to be understood that Native people were scientists from way back, like, they've always been scientific, and what else is science but observations, and that's what they did, they looked at the sky, they looked at the moon, the sun, they looked at the way that, you know, water flows, they looked at the way that plants grow, the even animal behavior, they looked at all of these and they were able to derive life ways out of it. And see, like, the way that we understand intelligence as Navajo people, not talking about natives in general, but Navajo people, Navajo thought comes from the very first Yindana, and they taught us, like, um, the, the sacred like what do you call it like essence of thought they put that in their minds and so you know like <laughs> how could we um how could we not know you know what i'm saying like this this scientific knowledge was what we developed after years of listening to to our life ways our our old ways our origin ways of course we would know it. As part of us, we're natural scientists. Absolutely. And so as we continue on now, um, talking about this, you know, we want people to hold in their minds and thinking about how um, indigenous knowledge systems have so much to contribute to the world. Um, you know, we've endured um, genocides and still to this day, you know, knowledge systems are disregarded or not seen as, um, you know, when we think about something like um, a rocket, we automatically associate science, math, engineering to that. But do we, when we think about a snowshoe or a canoe, maybe, you know, we are, we don't think naturally to look at it in the same way. And so we're trying through this, through this series and through the work that we're doing, to, to make visible what has been made invisible um, from colonialism. And so, um, so yeah, so I, that's why I'm really excited to have so many wonderful, beautiful people participating in this series and that everyone who's listening in, um, you, know, to take, you know, to take away these important messages and to, to start to listen and look and see and continue to make space um, for people like Dana to do this important work. And so I think, you know, this Crab Nebula that brought us together um, <laughs> is uh, I'm going to now turn it over to Dana and to go through this wonderful uh, presentation she has for us. Okay. So, um, Haji Ne Hane. This is the entire collection of Navajo history as told like orally, like Navajo does have a writing system. Navajo does record, um, like even our medicine people record things on parchment. But um, Hajine Hane is the collection of oral, oral stories that are only told like during certain times. And the only people who tell them are like elders, like grandparents, people who, you know, who have something to teach. And they only tell people that they they want to help form and shape, like, you know, with their form and shape their minds. 
So what I'm telling you, what I'm going to tell you is supremely important, especially when it comes to Navajo personhood. So what I tell you is not for you to manipulate or or um, use to your own device. Like, take it with um, a grain of salt. Also, Hajine Hane is so um, diverse. Like, we we recognize certain themes of of the different parts of the stories, but the characters change, the events change. So that's the nature of um of Navajo thought. You have to know that when you hear the story, there will be changes and no story is incorrect. Like there's no wrong way to do this. Like each person has their own version of the story and they're all gonna tell you the way that they know it. So the more that you listen to the stories, the more you, you know, hear it, the more you understand it, your knowledge grows. But it causes you to flex your idea of like of reality. And that's that's um part of that Navajo thought. The Navajo person has been given the gift of incredible um, creative thinking, like proactivity, like imagination and um, critical thinking abilities. And that's, that's the nature of a human being, according to Navajo, to have that, that great capacity for thinking. So the story I'm telling you is not singular. There's not any one way to tell the story. Like we have over a hundred ceremonies and each version of the Hajinehane is going to going to match each of those ceremonies. So Hajinehane is the verse. This is not the only way of understanding. Like there are much, 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 much more. So I don't want you to think linearly when I'm telling you the story. Um, it's better to keep your mind open and uh, make comparisons like the the themes remain the same oh uh, next slide okay so it begins with something called like this is the black part the, it means dark and it is surface like you know you can feel it you can touch it um, you you walk upon it like ne is a hard surface. So this hard um, place, this this black world, there was nothing there, but mists, you know, like clouds. They call it like sparkling mist. And so there was, this that's all that was existent way back before this world. Now. If you think like an astrobiologist, you can imagine that this mist looked like a lot of what we pick up off of like images from the Hubble Space Telescope. This image right here um, is from the Orion Nebula. And I like to use this one because it kind of looks like that, like mist, gaseous swarms of air, and that was all existence of that. That's that's what was in existence according to our old stories. But in the middle of this mist, light gathered, and this light, it had um, characteristics of a creator, it had characteristics of intelligence, and also had characteristics of divine love and care. And this 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 light that gathered that with the divine intelligence and care, it is personified and acknowledged as a creator deity being Yathlitneyane. So Yathlitneyane, um, you know, if I if I show it to you on the screen, like um, you know, I'm a linguist, so ya is up, athlete means in the middle. Neyane is uh, spirit energy. 
and so like literally it's the spirit energy of the sky so when people say like stuff like um father creator you know mother earth you know it's pan indianism and it doesn't really give justice to the real deities who 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 brought us to our being right now okay next next yeah there we go okay so this is um oh back 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 just one back one slide back okay so <clears throat> yeah right there so right here is the artist's depiction of what the beginning looked like and so i just described it to you as being the light that co that collected in all of these mist and this in this artist depiction you see something that's like spiraling looks like it's exploding you know like the big bang the big bang sent out so much energy and matter into the universe that you know like all kinds of creation began you know like whole galaxies stars um uh, planets and so from this one we can gather like from the very beginning, there was nothing but earth, not earth, light gathered in the beginning, and that was the beginning. So if we think about that light as actually being the Big Bang event, based on the scientific timeline, we can, we can estimate that time as being 14 billion years ago. Now, this knowledge is part of our sacred knowledge it's haji net like it's a story of where we came from so when this light gathered and perhaps that was a big bang maybe our stories are 14 billion years old now in this black world there was no surface no water no nothing just this light began but out of this light had the intelligence to put things into being so you look at this um, artist depiction and you see beings in each cardinal direction. Now, the other beings that are there, I mean, there's more. Next slide. Okay. Wasps, spider ants, black ants, odorous little creatures, Beetles, dragonflies, bat people, spider man, spider woman, salt man, salt woman, insect people, all together. Okay, so these people are not, they're not form like you and I, like, they don't have a, a like, like a physical hand or like, you know, a body, they're, they're air spirit people, but still, we name them as insect people. Now, I want you to think. When people name things, they name them according to the language that they already have. Like, um, for example, um, um, besh, besh not I. Besh means middle. Not uh, means a fly, but in Navajo, that actually means the text messages. Besh is metal and not uh, means a fly. But does that literally mean like, you know, text message? No. So we name things according to the language that we already have. So you think about the primordial life that existed on earth um what did they do they have tiny bodies they have small legs this part right here about odorous little creatures is especially interesting because for a certain part on earth there were very simple celled creatures that 
didn't give off carbon dioxide like you and I do. They gave off methane. And when you think about methane, like you ever smelled methane? If you drove through the state of Texas, you smelled methane. Um, cows are known for producing methane. So like the stories talk about odorous little creatures. It doesn't talk about what they look like. It doesn't talk about how big or small they were, but all that they is that they were odorous and they were little. Now, like I said, we name things according to the language that we have. And so, yeah, we say wasps, sputter ants, black ants, beetles, dragonflies. Those are the insect people. But what if we were trying to name something else that is not an insect? Also small, also crawls around or might have wings. You know, you gotta think about, you gotta think like, this is the way that we describe them. If we saw them today, if we saw what they were talking about today, would we still call them by the names that we have known them by? Like wasp, better ants, black ants, beetles, dragonflies? Those are contemporary creatures that we see today. But we only call them like these names because that's the way that we understand them. Next slide. All right. So this one, okay. So Navajo Hajine means the upward moving up and out. And so there are underworlds. We have four underworlds. We have a black, we have a blue, we have a yellow, we have a white. And so the, the Hajine Hanet is the culmination of all of those stories about how we came into emergence to this place that we know now. So from black, we turn to blue. And that's what it means, like transition from Nehuatishkesh to Nehuatishkesh. Dishkesh is black and Dishkesh indicates blue. So Nih, like I said, that was um, the surface. And so every single time we move from one world to another, there are certain circumstances that occurred. Like the stories all tell something different. Like none of the stories are the same, but yet we have to keep sharing those stories. That way we broaden our minds and expand our knowledge. Like none of those stories are wrong. Okay, so some of them are fire, flood, and quarreling. Oh, next slide. Okay, so here we have hushed Asian and don't so set with the hish on fire because of the mischievous things that Ma'i discovered. So Ma'i is our um, our trickster. He's the coyote. We only tell these stories in winter time. So these things that he found, like bad luck, jealousy, greed, bad attitude. We usually only talk about those in wintertime, but you know, you can kind of like off topic, you know, mention it. But um, Hush Asian is the black god and he usually sits in the north and Don't So is one of those um, big, big insects. They set it on fire, they burnt the whole ward down because um, they were upset of the things that Coyote found. So, um, Daniela, when I shared this information with her, she said, yeah, like there was a fire earth. At some point, the whole earth, the whole earth, the whole earth was covered with um, uh, volcanic activity. There were eruptions happening all over the globe. There was no like water. There was no like air that we could breathe. Like it was, it was a volatile place and it's just like burning. And so here in our, our own story, we have evidence. I mean, we have stories about 
when the whole world burned. Next slide. The other one is a flood. So people were mischievous. How they were mischievous, the first upon the people that you ask for is. But yeah, there were chiefs in every direction. And they were the chiefs told them, stop doing your misdeeds, stop that. And they told them four times. Each of the chiefs said that four times, like, hey, you're you're misbehaving. I don't appreciate it. Stop that. And then so after four different requests, they were told to just vacate. They're like, hey, get out of here. You don't belong here. There's no room for here. You here anyways. And um, so each of these chiefs, and guy, they sent floods from every direction. And so the 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 people had no no choice but to vacate. And it's told that they went up in a spirally manner up into they met the sky and they had to find a way through, like they had to find a hole in, in order to get through to the next world. Next slide. Okay. Now this one, quarreling, is this is a part of every single one of the transitions of, from one world to the next. The people were always arguing and there was a lot of unrest. People were doing each other wrong. They were getting too crowded. There wasn't enough food, like not enough shelter. Oh, excuse me. So sorry. Excuse me. But um, yeah, they were forced to leave. And then again, they blew up and then emerged into the next world. Next slide, please. All right. So now we move into the blue world. So next slide. The blue world is blue. You know, like everything around it is blue. The sky is blue. Everything's blue. And the people who lived there, they were bird people. Blue swallow people, blue birds, blue hawks, blue jays, blue herons, blue feathered beans. Now, yeah, okay. So first we had insects, and now we have birds. So blue feathered beans. That's curious because I wanted to be a paleontologist when I was a kid, and I still love dinosaurs. I still like what like I read articles about them all the time. And so, the one of the new discoveries is that they figured that. Dinosaurs didn't have scales, instead they had feathers. So this part intrigued me because in my my research, it doesn't re it doesn't refer to an actual bird like bluebirds, hawks, jays, or herons, but blue feathered beans. If we had language for it, we would name it. That that's what I'm saying. Like Navajo loves to name their environment. They were always giving names to things. So like, if there was a blue feathered being that looked more like, you know, like a hawk or a heron or whatever, we would name it by that. But we didn't, we only called it a blue feathered being. And, you know, looks like dinosaurs used to have feathers too. Now, the most intriguing part of this is that I have friends who live near places who, um, where there are petroglyphs, like the ones that Jody was showing you, like near Chaco Canyon. They live in that area, and their people, their old people, will talk about seeing monsters, seeing monsters with their own eyes. And so what science science tells us like that's not possible, that they're all dead. 
you can you can hear in living history that these these beings existed and you can even see drawings of them like in the pictographs so it's up to you like if you want to believe you know that dinosaurs are dead and all that you can believe that or you can believe an elder or the the writings on the wall next slide again with the transition next slide okay this one is very important this transition like it goes from the blue world into the yellow world okay so it was destroyed by neol so so neol is um the wind so means lot like big and so this wind blew and blew the whole world into an ice age it was a freezing cold world like um like a i like a like a literal ice age and so in a sacred way um these elements like a kishin, which are a footprint, which is um the the chain lightning, a told is the um sheet lightning, shabak all is the um sunbeams, not elid is a rainbow. Using those sacred elements, people were transported to the next world. So Neil and blowing this world into an ice age is important because in a geological time record, there are two times that we experience a snowball earth. The earth was completely covered in ice. Two times in the geological record, it shows this. So here in our story, we also, we also have the same, same comparison, like, yeah, the world did go into an ice age before. Next slide. The other one is that uh, <laughs> adulterous. Um, the air spirit people were adulterous with their new host and were driven out. Um, so adultery is, um, a common theme like to the reasons why people were forced out of that world that they were in and forced into a new world. Now, I think that this story has been sensationalized because the people who recorded the story were white men. And of course, adultery is provocative, like, you know, sex, sex and that's, that's the point. That's why they took special attention to that. But this is like only by the anthro's perspective have I seen the story told that adultery was the reason why people were driven out of one world and forced into the next. I think I I think this is a a whitewashed version of the story. But yet yeah, um it's a it's uh it, it's there like you know if you do read Navajo folklore, um that's what you're gonna read. So take it with a grain of salt. Like, don't believe everything that you write or you read, because a lot of these people are non-native anthros, and what's interesting to them, that's what they're gonna write down. And you know, adultery, yeah, that's it's sexy, you know. Next slide. Quarreling. Quarreling is common among all the transitions. They were either arguing about access to shelter or access to food or, you know, like, um, again, adultery. But, um, yeah, like, the, the worlds underneath, like black world, the blue world, the yellow world, they all had limited resources. And so 
people people fought over that and that's the thing about about um these transitions is that you look at where we are right now we are arguing about land about access to resources um uh you know like the 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 rights to human human body you know we i think are on the precipice of another transition so i don't know what's next after this world but everything that i see around me it looks like we're headed into another world next slide okay yellow world um yellow world is one of the most interesting worlds next slide all right so here's where we get the advent of all of these um other little creatures light squirrels dark squirrels chipmunks mice rats turkey people lizards snakes beaver people frogs next slide Turtles, underwater people, big snake, mountain lion, otter, bear, deer people, wolf, kid fox, puma, wildcat. Next slide. Sparrow hawk, great hawk, kingfisher, blue martin, gila monster, various birds, horned toad, yellow fox, and blue fox. <sighs> you try saying that in one breath. Um, so we have a huge diversification of species. Like first we had the insect people and then we had the bird people. And now we have this explosion of different different animals that are that are, you know, it, it occupying the third world. Grasshopper people, cave dwellers, great swallow people, keys ani, ground heat people. Okay, so ground heat people is interesting because there are certain organisms that live off of the ground heat. Like, look at the bottom of the, the ocean, they have these thermal vents that just spew mineral rich, um, you know, waters into the ocean. And only there can some organisms thrive. We're not one of them, but, you know, certain different organisms. So, ground heat people, like, you know, there's a certain bacteria, you look at Yellowstone, they live according like to how hot that temperature of the, the, the thermal heated waters. You know, you look at morning glory pool, like each level of heat is marked by a different color of bacteria because there are, they are like uh, thermophiles. They love hot water and they thrive in a certain like temperature. And so, yeah, like there's certain people, people who live strictly off of the heat. And I think that like, I found this in my research, like ground heat people. How could Navajo know about that? How could Navajo know about the great deep ocean and the 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 people that live there or <clears throat> even among the the thermal like vents how could Navajo know about that but yet it's acknowledged in our emergence story so these things are curious but I think that Navajo has such a capacity for learning that they could look at anything around them and you know and recognize it for for how what it is next all right the final transition well some say final some say don't but um nehotsui is the yellow world and nehalkai is the white world uh next slide okay so in the third world are some of the most sensationalized stories like separation of the sexes like the great flood like yeah yeah so if you're navajo you grow up listening to those stories so one of the ways that the forced migration from yellow world to a blue world a white world um was that 
Coyote stole the, the, the children of the water monster. He, the water monster had beautiful twins and he took them, the coyote took them and stole them, hid them under his robe and the water monster in return like sent floods from the east and the west and the south and north and they, those floods were rushing like rushing toward the people like like great big mountains like big old walls of water were coming and they had to magically find a way to to get out of there and that's where we have the story of like the the big reed you know how a reed is like kind of like a bamboo plant like it's kind of wide and like it has like has joints and it goes up so magically there's a reed that they planted right there grew big enough to feed to fit all of the people up into it and grew tall enough all the way to reach the sky until they met the surface of it and then someone had to like dig their way through and the reason of that was like because of coyote coyote's mischief he took that water baby and so when there's different variations like some say like the coyote gave the babies back and then the water receded and then other stories say like the coyote said i'm gonna give you this one but i'm gonna keep this one and this baby will live in the mist and and in the dark um parts of the clouds so different different versions like but this is a, fa a famous story next Oh yeah, banishment. So this one doesn't have to do with the story of the flood, but I guess people were being adulterous and whatever. Yeah, I don't really um care for the like, the anthros like when they put this like adultery part. I really think that they're putting their own bias and their own prejudice like in this story. I don't think it's that. I don't think it's like that. So that requires my own um, research and my own writing so I can, you know, change the narrative because I seriously don't think that was it. Next. The white world. Next. The stories vary about Nihalgai. So you see, Coyote, Badger, Some stories regard the like these are Hashtag, which means the yin dene, like holy people, they are the most revered. So most stories say that they were there from the very beginning, like upon creation of this world, they were there, like they were part of it. Some other stories say that they were created until this part of the world, fourth world, out of like um, sacred, a sacred element, it's like, um, like like the sacred stones or using buckskin and um, Navajo basket. So this is part of that um, flexibility of mind that is important for Navajo people to understand. Like this, this is not um, linear. It kind of like loops around, comes back. The stories connect to each other, so it's not linear. Next. Transition from the white world to present. So from the white world, we get the creation of the clans, which means we get the creation of human beings. So uh, one of the holy people, like you know like when you get really dirty and you're able to like rub your skin and it comes off like i don't know if 
have you guys been that dirty? Like, you know, like, um, like that dusty and stuff. And you rub your skin and then it comes off like, like, you know, like a little black, like, I don't know if you've been that dusty, but <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you rub off some of that, that dirt. So our creation story talks about how one of our holy beings rubbed that dirt from um, her underarm and her breast and like you know and then she formed human beings from them like we are made from her her excess um and we were created in a beautiful way and she prescribed a way of life a way of living that you know would be good for us and that's what we're living by right now the same deity who, who who created us is also the mother of the warrior twins who killed all of the monsters. Well, I'm wrong about saying all because like some of the monsters were allowed to live. Some of the monsters that were allowed to live were um, poverty, old age, sickness, lice. Um, yeah, things that would... Um, Things, things that we know, you know, like things that will cause a person or things to deteriorate, like the they all petitioned for the saving of their lives to the warrior twins by saying, like, I'm important because, like, without me, you know, people would just be dirty or people, people wouldn't strive to make something for themselves or people wouldn't try to make, like, like better, better material goods. Um, so, yeah, they were allowed to live. And then traditional home life, like like right here in my house right now, I live with my mom and my dad, and we have a traditional home. Like, um, it's a mobile home, but we have all of the traditional elements in it. We have a fireplace. Um, we have honeshkish, which is um, uh, the fire poker, you know, the stick that you use to poke the fire. Um, we also have, you know, water. Um, we also have um, the grinding stones, and we have the stirring sticks, like like for food. The grinding stones and the stirring sticks are part of traditional home life because they protect us from poverty. They protect us from hunger. They protect us from um, old age and from sickness. So yeah, like um, even though this is a mobile home. This is still a traditional home, and we still live a traditional home life. Like, if we go over there on that side of the hill, we're going to get to my aunt's house, and she has a, a herd of sheep over there. My other aunt has her herd of sheep on this side, and just directly south of us, we have our herd of horses. And our horses are protection. Our horses, like our sheep, are our wealth. They feed us, like... You know, like, yeah, um, yeah, they protect us from, from, from going hungry. They protect us from poverty. Like, they're our wealth. And if we need to, we can butcher any single one of them. Yep, livestock agriculture. I just told you about that. Oh, we have a herd of, a family herd of cows. So I was telling you that down here on, in, down here in Tohachi is our winter camp. And in the summer, we have our summer camp up on top of the mountain. And over there, like the grass is green, the water is flowing all the time. We have a huge pasture area. But yeah, we keep our, our livestock over there during the summer. Now, it used to be that we would do um, trail rides. We would um, herd all of the sheep or cows using our horses. But my my aunts and my uncles have gotten a lot older, so now we just haul them in, you know, using our our stock trailers and stuff. But yeah, <laughs> we used to do that when I was younger. And then the long walk. I don't know if you guys know about this, 
but the U.S. Army persecuted and imprisoned the Navajo people for four years from 1964 to 1964 or 1864 to 1868, and um, we were prisoners of war. Um, they they found, they surrounded up like four thousand Navajo people, and only half of them made it through that four years. And even on the way down, a lot of our people died because the um, pregnant women and the elders who couldn't keep up were shot on sight. And small children, like, who tried to carry them, even them, they were shot right there and just left along the trail. Um, the U.S. Army. <clears throat> did that and they're still proud because the Navajo language saved them from World War II. <laughs> yeah, um, the United States exploits us all the time and they're doing it right now, especially during this pandemic. I think that they purposely are not getting us resources just to help help us die faster. Persecution is still happening. And then the Navajo Nation Council. <clears throat> Navajo Nation Council was set up in a way to get corporations to get authorization to to mine in Navajo country. So Navajo country is oil rich and also coal rich. But the way that the council was set up was that they picked a few people who didn't know too much and had them sign on behalf of the rest of the nation, uh, sign away our rights. And so we got into a contract that only gave us like 2% of, of whatever profits was being made out of the mines. And since then, that was like 1924 or something like that. And that's like almost a hundred years. Think about that, like 2%, like a few billion dollars. The Navajo Nation is getting ripped off. Um, so yeah, we come from like a super, super strong heritage. And now we are being belittled and exploited. And we're experiencing a genocide. Genocide still hasn't ended. We're still being killed right now, today, right now. Next slide, please. So this is a, a graphic of like, you know, how, how life evolved on Earth. The bottom part is 4.6 billion years ago and the top you know, it's where, we, where we're, we're riding around right now. So you look at some of these creatures, like look at the Paleozoic. So the Paleozoic looks like something that could have happened in the blue world. Um, oh, I mean the black world, I'm sorry, black world. You know, things, they're, they're insects, they're still crawling around, they're still, you know, they're still trying to, to swim. If you look at the Cambrian part of that, like the travel bite, yeah, it does look like a bug. Um, it does have a lot of legs. It does crawl around. You know, like Navajo language doesn't have a word for travel bite. And then you get like higher up through the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic er eras. And then you see like a diversification of species. You see all kinds, like you see the T-Rex, you see the fern, you see that dinosaur whose name I forgot, uh, and then the pterodactyl, different kind of leaves, different kind of fishes. If that's not a diversification of species, I don't know what is. But anyways, like the Navajo way of understanding like life on earth began very simply, first, first with bugs, and then with blue 
winged creatures and then an explosion of like you know small mammals and large mammals and then finally we get to like the the and the who we're supposed to be like like we are uh holy people next slide Hey Jody, how much time do I have left? What do you need? <laughs> how much do I need? Okay, um, okay. So this is the second <laughs> segment of, of my PowerPoint, and uh, I'm just I'm just trying to um, tie it all together without going too much over. This is um all incredibly beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Karen. Okay. All right. So let's, let's move on. Let's get, let's get right back into it. Next slide. All right. So, <clears throat> okay. So this is um, an, a sketch of what I've done about the end and the So I want to draw your attention to the small figure on the top left. That is Binaye, which means the monsters. Now, after the emergence into this world, the monsters were killing every everybody, like like um, any people that were around were being killed off. And so it was a time of great stress. Um, it was also a time of fear. Um, it was a time where people had to hide all the time. They were constantly in hiding. Now, this pandemic that we're going through, we're looking at it like this, like Binaye. Binaye, we have to hide from it. We have to shield ourselves from it. It's killing our people. So that's what we we are looking at it like from my household. Binaye, we have to always do things like ritually. To, to keep ourselves safe from it. Like we use our hand sanitizer religiously, we use our face mask, you know, just, it's automatic. Um, we use our, our cleaning wipes. We wipe down everything. We have our Lysol sprays. Like the, um, that means the bug that you cannot see. <clears throat> that that that's how we've named it but yeah like the kind of fear that we're living in right now is comparable to the fear that our people lived in back then so this 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 photo this this picture <clears throat> this drawing is um has a lot of navajo language on it and these are navajo names um, a lot of them are used in ceremony, and they rep the names are representative of some of our most important uh, spiritual people. So on the, I'm going to draw your attention to the right, and you see two stick figures of two women. You can see they're women because um, they have Navajo buns on and they have dresses. So one of the dresses is white. The other dress is um, mixed colors. But yeah, there's these two women and um, they come to us from the divine, like the Hashtag brought them here and they weren't human form when they were brought to this earth. They were figurines. One was made of white shell, and the other was made of turquoise. So, like, 
uh, ritually, spiritually, like with a whole bunch of prayers and chants, they were brought to life. And these two women, when they grew up um, to, to adulthood, they were the mothers of the two twins that we now know as the warrior twins, as those who killed off all of the not yet. So you might be wondering, um, at the top, you know, it says, ooh, 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 ooh. That is the sound that our talking God, Hashtag, makes when he is approaching. At first, it sounds faint. The second time, it sounds a little louder. The sec third town, third town is kind of loud. Then the fourth time, it sounds like he's right behind you, and then you you'll see him appear right there. So, um, the stories behind this single single drawing are are long. Like <laughs> we we could go about two more days and talk about how the sacred twins were born from their sacred mothers and how they um how they grew to be that way next slide oh this is one of my favorites right here Okay. All right. So Sha is the sun. Us is the cloud. Nats Ilid is the rainbow. Shabak Ol is the sunbeam. O Osnit is the place where the lightning hits the ground. Ihdishhish is the part of the rain the the rain cloud, like the active like how how rain is falling, and you see the darkest part of that, like you can see it. That's ish. And then kostishish is um how you can see a cloud, like a rain cloud, and like part of it is very black. That's that kostishish. And yanajin is when you look at a storm like from a distance, you can see the darkest part of it. It's almost black. That's that Yanajin. And then the Atzolagash. That's the sheet lightning. That's the kind that bounds like all over the sky. You can see the whole thing. And then Atzin Ish is the um the chain, the chain lightning, the one that goes all over the sky. And eat nip is is uh the generic term for lightning. So this is to show you that natural phenomena, natural creation, we call upon these for our protection. We talk about them in prayer. They surround us constantly, but yet we are their grandchildren. So it's, it's possible that you could be killed by any one of these the, the the innate relationship between human and each of these natural phenomena is is a kindness. There is um, a hope there, and we are the grandchildren of these sacred elements, these natural sacred powerful phenomena. We call upon these to to protect ourselves, to help ourselves. Like a whole bunch of our prayers are just so that it would rain. Um, some of them, like the not ilid, the rainbow, like if you ever seen a Navajo woman with her sash belt, like that red belt that she wears on her, her waist, that's that, that's that rainbow. And it's not just a belt. It's not just for aesthetics. It's not just because we like the rainbow we don't it's not because of that 
the, the sash belt has a total function. So the woman, uh, a menstruating age woman, is the only one who has a right to be wearing a sash belt because she can bring life into the world. So as she's giving birth, they will throw uh, her sash belt over a beam in the hogan, and then she'll hold on to the ends of that sash belt and and help to deliver her child. You know, like like she'll she'll deliver mostly like pretty much in a standing up position, according like, you know she'll be holding on to that belt, and after she gets through that that after that sash belt carries her through that, she will then wrap it around her body to give her healing to make sure that like you know her her organs go back into place and that she she has some kind of structure she's the foundation for her family so like that belt reinforces her and it's made uh, out of that 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 rainbow that knots elib so that's the power of it it's the beauty of it and we do that, like we decorate ourselves, like not just decorate, but it's also for function. Like the Shabbat old, like I don't know if you've seen um, a Navajo hair bun, but if you did, like it's at the back of a person's head. And then like um, the hair tie will, will be white. And the white color is to signify, signify that sunbeam, that Shabbat old. So we, we wrap our hair in the sunbeams. And then our moccasins itself, like that, and it's the one that goes so like the chain lightning, that's the stitching that we use to put the buckskin pieces together on our moccasins. That that dark cloud, that is our hair. Like that is our hair right here. Like So yeah. These are, these natural phenomena, we are dressed with it. They protect us, we are their grandchildren. Next slide. Next slide. So this one, I'm sorry for my tiny little writing, but this is a sketch of um, the different Dene, like different holy people. And really like where they stand in, in Navajo philosophy. And it's also talking about how the first man and the first woman brought about, brought about some of the other Dene, like the Dene, holy people, they can be brought into creation. They are done so ritually. So when you look at the spirals on the top left, that's the ritual. Like it has to be done four times. And each time, like Nish is the air, each time the air has to enter the circle, circle around and come back out. Four times the air has to do this and then can be animation, like creation and life. So this one's a little bit too, compli so too complicated to get into, but um, I do want to show you that there is structure to the Navajo way of thinking. Like, you can see the sun over here on the right, and then right here, like on that sunbeam, you see Jin Dene. Those are daytime people. And if you go like south of this little butte that I drew here, um, you see Yatok Ej Dene. That's the blue, blue, blue daytime people. And if you go to the west side of that butte, Tsutso Adin Din Dene. That means, um, those yellow sun rays that you see in the sky, those people. And then you look to the top of this little butte, you see Now those are dark sky people. So everything about Navajo philosophy and Navajo ways of knowing 
it follows the progression of the sun. So j is that um, daytime. Now j it, it refers to a time of the morning when things are bright and they're fresh and they're new. And yodok age refers to a time of the daytime when things the, the sky is like bright blue. Um, it's later on at daytime. It's it's a lot hotter than than like at the first you know first sunrise. And then so I didn't deem that yellow yellow sunshine event that refers to the end of the day when all those brilliant beams of gold you know are are shining through the sky. And then Chachet in the end is um is referring to people who are part of that skylight event. Like you ever look at the sky and you see like a the sky is kind of glowing. Like especially if there's no moon out, you seem to to see the sky have a glow. That that is Chachesh. That that darkness, the starlight is Chachesh. So it follows natural order from the time that the sun comes up to the sun comes above us and to the sun comes down. And then when it goes, you know, it, 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 it goes to rest. The Navajo people live their life according to this cycle. It's Sha Big Echo. So that Sha is the sun, Big Echo means according to it. So it's a prayerful life. There's a prayer for every single one of these times of day. And it's a structure. It, 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 it has order. Like it's um, divinely designed for Navajo people. And there's a certain time of day for planning. There's different time of plan for action, different time for reflecting. Like there's a certain time, you know, just to share and like, you know, share share goodness, share kindness, share stories, share, talk to one another. There are times of the day for everything. So this, 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 um, this sketch is meant to show that, and it's way deeper than I'm even telling you right now. Like, oh gosh, um, what are you guys doing for the next eight hours? Kidding. <laughs> but, yeah. I'm spending it with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it it's a lot. It's a lot. Um I'm I'm totally happy to share, but like, you know, it's a lot. Um so the, the Navajo words that you see, um though they're they're Navajo names. There's they're ceremonial names. We we usually only call upon them like during ceremony. So uh you're very privileged to look at, you know, the, the language here. I'm uh, also a, a linguist, a Navajo linguist. So one of the things that we're doing is developing our writing system to be consistent and correct so that we can use it to teach our future generations. Next, please. So this one depicts the story of the Navajo cradle board. Again, this can be a whole like hour long teaching. So I mentioned that there were warrior twins. Now, one of them is the warrior who slays all of like the dragons, the naye, the monsters. The other one, his younger brother, he's there like as um backup. Like he he keeps track of him. He takes care of him. After the battles, he picks him back up and you know gives him the medicine that he needs to revive himself. Um, so the one on the left is the warrior. The one on the right is his support. And from these two, we get a lot of lessons. Uh, we get the lessons that you should be healthy. Uh, you should um, be like fit, you know, like ready for the fight. 
Um, we also get lessons of kinship, of how you should treat one another, of how you should look after one another, and how that, um, like, through different struggles, you, you're, you're better off, like, with support from your family. And their, their, um, their cradle boards alone, like, they are the greatest protection. And this is, this is where the strength of the cradle board comes in. So they are like the the strings i know it's kind of like a bad image look at i try to make it deep like more dark but um the bindings the ones that go back and forth like to hold a baby in the cradle board those are made of a soul and it's in fish which are the different kinds of lightning um shabak all is one of the bindings also and then the 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 arch that goes over the baby's head that is made of the rainbow, the knot elip. And then a baby a baby's um cradle board also has a cover. And so those are um I'm saying it wrong. Um and Nistabaad um Ustashish is that dark part of the um the cloud, like I mentioned, that's like the darkest part of the cloud. And Nitsa, Nitsa is rain, and Ba'ad is the female part of it. So, like, you ever witnessed, like, um, a sprinkle that's so gentle that it feels kind of like mist? That's Nitsa Ba'ad. So, blanket of that fine mist and that dark cloud were used um, to cover these cradle boards. And, you know, the, the, the sunbeams, the Shabbat Lol and the Tim Ish and the Tolda, the lightning, were used to bind them, like to keep them in there. And so, in doing so, these two infants were given the highest, utmost protection. And that's what we do, is that same symbolic protection that we put on our Navajo babies when we put them in a cradle board. And that's the significance of it. Like, we love them so much that we protect them with the power of the natural forces, you know, as we wrap them. We wrap our babies with these powerful natural forces. And it's incredible. Like, like if I ever have a baby, I'm going to sure put it in the cradle board and I'll, I'll know and I'll recognize these natural forces as I'm wrapping him or her up. It's, it's beautiful, you know? Like, how much love do you put into your own child, into your own, your own infant, like, protected by the universe? Next slide. Oh, <laughs> this one, this one's a winter story. I can't tell you this one. Next slide. Okay. So this one's back from um from um from the the mural the picture of the mural that I took done by Raymond Clark. Um so this kind of looks like like what we do today like we still hold ceremonies we still plant farms we still keep our herds of sheep cows and horses we still have our traditional dress. We're still doing this, you know, after all of that emergence, after all of that trauma, we still living the same way. Next one. And it's different, you know, like we're doing our best to live. Some people do research. Some people do rodeo. Um, I just do research though. I don't do rodeo. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, it, that's pretty much like Navajo life. Like we live, we still live according to the sun. We still have our traditional teachings of home and family. We still have our language. My parents are 
are are full language speakers and I'm becoming one as well. Like um Diego the neck etchiko yes kid. Um you know I really I'm I'm strong with my language. I'm a linguist also so I'm studying it from a scientific level as well. But yeah, my language means everything to me. Like that's all I learned like when I was born like my parents and my grandparents all they did was speak Navajo to me and that was my first language. Like when I was a baby in my crib, I used to say a bit, a bit, and that means milk. I would cry for milk <laughs> in my own language. So we're we're not gone. Yeah, our people are suffering. We don't have the resources that we need, but still we are resilient. Next slide. Oh, this is amazing. And there's yeah. the actual citational practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So these are not all of this, all of the references, like um, these are the ones specific to this, this um, PowerPoint. But I did tell you a lot more than what I've learned from these resources, like like life, my parents, my mom, you know, my, my grandma, my aunties, they all had a lot to contribute in this. And that's my fault. I didn't I didn't cite them in here. I should have. I'll I'll, I'll make sure to update that. But yeah, like um plan teachings are super strong. And they, 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 they're, they're what keep me rooted. Like I'm, I'm not leaving here and I'm not leaving them. There's, there's no way that, there's no, no way that I would ever want to change. And uh, we don't want you to. <laughs> this is <laughs> so beautiful. I mean, so many of us probably, I love the way that you speak. I love the way that you're so thoughtful and reflective in the moment. Um, I felt like in some ways that um, just, you know, loving who you are as a human being and so incredibly grateful for all of the protective devices and technologies that your parents and your grandparents um, surround you with. Um, and also thinking about how we can offer care in this moment in time to you and your family and your community. Um, maybe if there's something that we can do to help um, your community and your family in this moment in time? Well, um, we, <clears throat> my people, my, my family were suffering because uh, we don't have a lot of access to some of like the um, cleaning, cleaning supplies. Like we don't have any sanitizing wipes or hand sanitizer. Um, we're doing our best with bleach, like, um, we have bleach, but, like, you know, just, just daily, like, the PPE, like, the, uh, masks and stuff, yeah, um, I'd be happy to take anything that you guys are willing to give, um, yeah, should I give you my address now? <laughs> Yeah, maybe um, Jody. Maybe we could share it on um, the website as well, um, okay. so that we can send you material or um, start maybe a fund that we can help with. Um, so let's get that on the website. So um, so Dana, we can we can assist the best that we can. All right. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much, Karen. I Absolutely. Appreciate very much. We will definitely follow up with that. Yeah. <laughs> and you are such a beautiful human being. And I feel so honored to have spent this time with you tonight. 
Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, Karen. It's been my pleasure to share this story again. And your your drawings, they're like maps to tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about this um, emergence right now and the emergences that your people have been through and ongoing emergence and ongoing transitions. Um, you've taught us so much in um, this short period of time and we are forever grateful. I appreciate it. Um, the Navajo Nation is strong. It's very strong. Yes. Where, yeah, um, I don't know, like, we're in a, in a state of emergency, like, we're in a state under stress, but our hearts are still here. Our, our teachings are still here, and our language is still here, still here, like, I don't know, like, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'd be happy to take sense. any questions from anybody. Yeah, are there? Let me see. Yeah, so let's start with um, the conversation with our witnesses that are joining us from all over. Um, are there any particular um, questions that you have, comments? Um, keeping in mind all of the um, labor and thought uh, and embodiment of knowledge that Dana has just shared with us. Looks like we have a question. Um, yes, Lisa, please. Oh, there's Lisa. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Um, I'm Haudenosaunee from Six Nations in Ontario. And um, earlier when you first started speaking, you had you had said, um, I want to I want you to explain it to me. So I, I may I might be confused. You had said when people talk about um, uh, Mother Earth, and they talk about the Creator. Um, that is that can be Pan Indianism. I think that's the term. That's a term I I've heard anyway. By that, did you mean when we talk about these things, these indigenous knowledge things, we really should use our traditional language? because in our traditional languages, the things that we talk about, such as um, who created us, who we believe created us and where we live now, these places, um, there's so much more meaning within the language. So we should use our traditional language terms. Is that what you yeah. meant? Yes, absolutely. Um, like Yatashish and Nahastan, you can't replace that. You can't translate that. Like Yatashish, like when you say ya, like that part of it means up. Yatashish means blue. Um, Nahastan refers to the earth surface and that being the female. It doesn't, it doesn't translate. We have to use their ceremonial names because these the yin, these holy people, they need to be acknowledged. They like hearing their names. So when we utter prayer words, we're acknowledging in them. Like, it, 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 won't, it won't mean the same thing if I say Father Sky or Mother Earth, like, yeah, it ain't, it's not the same. So I advocate fully for calling the, the, the holy people 
their names because they deserve to be acknowledged and that's what they want. Like the whole world is out of balance and it's because we, we stop saying our prayers. We're prayerful people. We're, we have prayer for all times of day and we stop saying that. We stop saying it on a regular basis. Like they miss it. They love it when we call them by their name. Yeah. Yahweh. Are there any other um, questions that folks have? Um, you can please just type them in the chat box. Okay, so um, Rachel is asking, um, I think you've already responded to this um, particular inquiry, but are the, these knowledges from many people or are they from one main source? You, you've already talked about this. Yeah, um, so in Navajo way of knowing, um, no one person has all of the knowledge. The way that you grow it is by listening to other people. So yeah, um, everything I've shared with you is based on my years of research, um, not just looking at books, articles, you know, historic papers, but um, my own people, my, my, my uncles, my aunties, you know, my grandparents already passed. I wish I asked, I wish I was smart enough to ask this stuff from them before they passed. I wasn't that smart when I was young, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, this is the culmination of many, many, many inquiries over the years. Thank you. Um, Jody, do you have any sort of final kind of thoughts or comments? I just think it's like, what it's just such a, a gift to be able to listen to what's being shared and, um, I know in our conversations, like there's just so much just incredible um, knowledge. And I think about like, we've talked about different stars and constellations and the significance of those. And I just, and your words, you know, earlier really resonate and, and remind us about how important indigenous knowledge systems are um, and that you know, we are sitting all online right now because we have stopped listening to and following our original instructions. And all people, all in, everyone's indigenous to some somewhere. Everyone comes from a land, from a people, from a language. Um, and at one point, you know, those were all the same. And that's why when we look around the world, we, we see um, so many similarities amongst indigenous peoples around the world because we all have those similar original instructions um, and uh, we need to smarten up. We need to get back to, to getting um, back in tune with what's going on around us um, because uh, we can't sustain like this, this, it's not going to be sustainable for much longer. So hopefully this is another way to be thinking about um, ways in which we can do that together. And so I just want to thank you again, Dana, you're just such a gift to this world. And we're just really blessed and privileged to have you on here. And, um, and I know uh, I'm looking forward to the next weeks to come as well. And I just want to again, thank Karen for just doing an amazing job and keeping us all grounded. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. everybody. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's think about next week as well. So we have um, Jody. Do you want to introduce who's speaking next week? We have I know Wilfred. Do you want to mention that? Yes. Um, just let me. Hang on one second. Wilfred Buck and Daniela. Yeah, I just wanted to put up on the the screen, but my computer is being a little bit wonky here. Okay. I'm going to throw this up so people can see and take note. Um, 
So yes, so next week we have Wilfred Buck and Daniela Galis and um, Daniela was referenced earlier today um, by Dana and she has, I'm not sure what exactly they're gonna talk about right now, but um, from what I've listened to, um, she has the most beautiful way of talking about the science behind how we all come from the stars um, and how that scientific story is perfectly al aligns with so many indigenous stories as well and understandings. Um, and she's worked with Wilfred as well in the past and uh, they know each other. And of course, Wilfred has actually um, inspired us here in Ontario through this work that we're now engaged in. Um, we've been watching him uh, and the incredible work he's been doing known as the science guy and the star guy um, and traveling around with um, pop-up planetariums where you can be immersed um, in the stars and listen to Wilfred's stories, incredible stories. And when I say stories, this is another thing I want people to think about is um, because often when we say story, there's this connotation or association that it's, you know, maybe not true or it's something that's made up. Um, that's why I hate when we say myths and legends and whatnot, but story is a recount. It's a historical, it's, it's factual, it's scientific. It's all of those things woven together in a beautiful narrative. That's what makes storytelling so powerful. Um, and, and people want to listen to that. So Wilfred um, is a master at, the, at, at doing this. And so we're really excited for him next week. And when you sign up, um, the sign up for is right there. Um, when you go into the registration forms, you can see the links for all of the, all of the uh, upcoming events are in there as well. So we'll share them out weekly as well. Um, and again, just a reminder, all of our, uh, all of our series is recorded. Um, it does, there is a bit of a lag time in getting them posted onto our website, but we do share out the link first to everyone who's registered. So you'll get, you'll get that link um, in a day or two, and then eventually it'll get uploaded onto our website. Thank you. Yes. I was in also just uh, wanting to mention just a, a reiteration, um, just about the light gatherers, like the light gather, and think about like how there was this gathering of light at the beginning. And in this light was love, um, intelligence, and care. And um, I just wanted to just bring that back into the world um, from your teachings tonight, uh, Dana. And um, I, I'm certainly gonna hold on to that for quite some time and thinking about how do we re- choreograph our gatherings into this idea of ga light gatherings that are filled with love and care for each other. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you for all of your offerings tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to more conversations. Uh, so we also have our keeping an archive of all of the questions. I know that there was a couple more that we didn't get a chance to get to, um, but we are keeping an archive of the questions and we're going to hold space for them and they will be informing other iterations of this project. So just thank you for your thoughtfulness in those, those questions. So I think, I think that's it uh, for tonight. Um, so thank you everybody. And um, we look forward to uh, further conversations. Be well um, and know that uh, we're thinking about you and we offer care to you and your families.